Um, this is the schedule. Two weeks ago we did not have this class. Last week we did. We had a class called Inviting God to Church. Today we want to talk about worship form and community. That is, particularly I'm going to be doing some more history stuff. Early on in the first class I talked about the different ways the church, broad speaking, in, in big periods of history, uh, thought about worship. How it was house church before the time of Constantine, and then it became very formalized um, and actually started adopting some of the pagan Roman uh, and Greek ritual in an effort to figure out how we worship, uh, and then etc. So, but today, what I want us to do is to get into a little more detail about the specific historical antecedents to the styles of worship today. Um, and I'll, I'll explain what that means in, in just a moment and why that's important, I think. Um, that's why worship forms and community, because we all come from a particular community, and as part of a particular Christian community, we have assumptions about what right worship is. Until we understand that there are very differing histories, very different uh, traditions that have developed, and so people have very different strategies, I don't think we have the ability to, to accurately be able to talk about what should worship be because we're not really clear what our choices are, because we don't really understand traditions other than our own. We assume, assume that our tradition is normative. So we'll get into that. Um, and then next week we'll talk about liturgy and elements of worship, um, then worship in the postmodern world, and the conclusion and final exam. Um, I'm going to try to have for you next week, which would uh, be our fifth meeting class, I say try because Caroline had to run up to Texas the first part of next week. So I will try to have that to you, um, not, not next week, but there are ne next week at the next meeting class that we have. Um, I'll do the best I can. If not then, then as soon after that as I can, I'll email it to people. All right. Today, uh, we'll, these are something we looked at last week, um, and that is the importance of worship practices. Worship necessarily, as we've discussed, has two parts in terms of the practical aspect. There is the theological content, what's behind it, and the practical form, what do we actually do. Now, in these cases, I'm talking about corporate worship more than personal worship. The elements of worship reflect the relationship between the theological content and the practical form, between the theology behind the practices and the practices themselves. But something that I don't think many people realize is that the church has not, and still today, does not start with theology like a written, formulated theology, it starts with worship. In fact, there is an accepted understanding that the primary theology, that is the first theology that the Christians had, was the theology of worship. They began worshiping before they thought out and wrote down what it was they believed. And so we need to understand that if theological language is the secondary reflection, the primary language of theology, or the primary theology, comes in the language of worship and prayer. So we start there. That's where the church has always started. So much so that we can say that a person's prayer life, for instance, and here I'm using prayer and worship fairly synonymously because prayer being communication and interaction with God is reflective of what worship is, which is God's invitation to us and our response to Him. And that, that calls for prayer, that calls for that interaction. That a person's prayer life is a better indicator of their beliefs than any explicit statements of faith. Um, it's more what you do than what you say about what you're going to do. In fact, there is a saying in the church, lex orandi, lex credendi. That's uh, Latin, which means as you pray, so you believe, in that order. And so that's why worship is critical to our, the practice of worship is critical to any theological understanding we might then articulate in terms of creeds or theology of that sort. These are all things we talked about last week, but I want them to be kind of a, it's important to review this because it's preliminary to what we're going to talk about today. Similarly, worship today is said to be experiencing a renewal, but there are major cultural trends which affect the ability of Christians to uh, worship accurately or well or in a fulfilling way, however you want to say that. One is the ever-increasing power of the media and the entertainment industry, and that includes the significant power and growth of the contemporary, uh, contemporary Christian music industry, which is a very modern invention. It only started in the 1970s, and yet it is so significant today. It, it greatly impacts, and, and not only the contemporary Christian music area, but movies and television and everything else. It affects it in very specific ways in terms of us drawing elements from those media sources into our worship activities.
But it also has an effect, perhaps even in a greater way, because it conditions people to certain, um, a certain attention span, to certain expectations. Uh, we have created sort of a passive entertainment oriented uh, mentality, especially in people in North America, and therefore they approach worship like that. And as a result of that, a lot of people have the reaction that, uh, well, I didn't find that, that worship fulfilling because they were expecting to be what? Entertained? That they were expecting to be stimulated in some way? Much of our modern media culture has conditioned us that way. And so we see that reflected in how people come to worship. So we have the ever-increasing effect of the media and the entertainment industries, but we also have the modern love for spirituality, but a mistrust of religion. As we, I often hear people say, well, you know, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious, which again, I believe means I want all the benefits and none of the responsibilities. I want to get all the good stuff. I don't have to do anything. And so that's why you get people who say, well, you know, I... I I find God by going out to the mountains and the rivers, not in church. I don't, I don't, who would want to go to church, right? In other words, they're rejecting religion in terms of any sort of formal um, establishment of a pattern or practices in favor of what feels right. They want to be spiritual but not religious, and that has a huge effect. That while worship calls forth deep feelings, we need to recognize that contrary to modern motivation, it is not... In the, in, in the end analysis, an individual quest for an encounter with God or the spiritual. It's not all about me. It's not all about you. It's about God. And it is about particularly how we as the Christian community approach, relate to, communicate with, come into a more intimate relationship with God. But everything in our modern culture seems to be pushing us away from those inclinations. And that worship particularly orients itself around things God has done in history. It is God's creation, that he is the creator God, and we worship him for that. He has called forth his people. He has, um, he has sent Jesus Christ, his, his very son, to live and die, be resurrected and ascended for us. The Christ story, we're going to get into that a little bit today. So it is what God has done in history, and it's about the things that Christians, in response to that, have done in the presence of God. Again, God the two halves of worship. God calls us, we respond. But particularly, God has called us by how he has acted in history. And frequently, our response is based upon our acknowledgement that God is a truly powerful and great and worthy God because of what he's made to do. So all that is sort of background. Those are things we talked about last week. For those of you who weren't able to hear, be here last week, two of you at least. Um, that gives you kind of a, catches you up on some of the critical points. Based on all that, and I've given you several definitions for worship already, but I want to get a little academic, a little technical for a minute, and then unwrap something. We can ask the question, what then is worship? As Christians, we can identify that while different people have different understandings, there is personal worship, there's corporate worship. Especially, though, as we talk about corporate worship, there are five aspects that we as Christians believe are components of worship. The first is that worship is a set of culturally embedded and corporate practices. It's a communal set of practices because whatever else we might want to say about, we all come from a particular cultural background. Whatever church you go to, I don't care what it is, there is going to be some reflection of the culture that the people come out of, and it's going to be reflected in what, we, what that group of people do together, corporate practices. You cannot get away from that. The, best, the only thing we can do is recognize where that's coming from, you know, what the culture is, and how that culture has influenced us, and how that's getting manifested in our corporate practices. But to say, oh, the church should not be influenced by culture is simply silly. Anytime you get you know, two people together in one place, you have culture. And so you have cultural, you know, all, all the stuff that they bring out of their past is going to be reflected in that. Worship, therefore, is a particular kind of cultural space. The practice of worship has, is, has always been and will always be influenced by the culture that people come out of. So we recognize that it's a set of culturally embedded corporate practices. The worship that is done in, in Nairobi, you know, the churches in Nairobi, Kenya, is very different than the churches in 
Myanmar, which is very different than the churches in Alabama, which is very different than the churches in New England. All of them come from a different cultural background. They also have some historical issues that affected their culture and therefore affect what gets carried down. We're going to talk about some of that. Secondly, we believe that it is through the various forms, uh, the various uh, approaches to worship, that God forms us into the likeness of Christ. This is the goal of the Christian life, is to be made more Christ-like. There are various ways of talking about that and looking at it within churches. In fact, the Catholic Church talks about that as we be becoming more Christ-like, they refer to as conversion, because you grow into your conversion of the Catholic Church. Um, the Orthodox churches, some of them, refer to this as deification. I mean, the, the, we as Protestants typically talk about sanctification, meaning we're being made more holy, that the Holy Spirit, but what that means is we're being made more like Christ. So different major Christian traditions use different words. Because the Orthodox say we're being made more like Christ, they call it the process of deification. That sounds wrong to us, but that's the word they use. And conversion, because in the Catholic Church, you're being converted more into the image of Christ. Those words mean something very different to us as Protestants. And we need to recognize that. But still, all Christian history, or all Christian churches in history, have seen that worship is a process by which God helps form us into the likeness of Christ, to make us more holy, to make us more like Him. We talk about being Christ-like. There he is. That's our... Okay, I, I, I thought we lost you. So, okay. Um, it's also true that as Christians we believe that worship is in and through the story of Jesus Christ. As I said earlier, all of God's acts in history are sort of a background to our faith, our worship of Him. God's, God being the Creator God in creation, in calling forth a people, that He is a relational God who, who had a people selected, chosen just for Himself, and then He worked through those people, the, the Jewish people, and then He sent His Son Jesus. So all of those are aspects that we recognize in our worship. But the most important one, the one we focus on most of all, the reason we're called the Christian Church, is because it is the, the story of Jesus Christ, of His birth, of his life and the model that he gave, of his teaching, of his sacrificial death, his resurrection, and his ascension. So worship is more than anything else done in and through our acknowledgement of the story of Jesus Christ. That's what makes us Christian. If you ever wonder whether or not a particular person or a particular group of people, a church, whatever, whether they are truly Christian, ask what they say about Jesus. Because what they say about Jesus is the a litmus test. That's the thing that will determine it. When you look at a church like, like the Mormon church or Christian science or Jehovah's Witnesses, when you ask them what they say about Jesus, you may have to dig a little bit because on the surface they may say what sounds like the right thing. The Mormons would say we believe Jesus was the Son of God, for instance. But if you dig deeper, you'll realize they, what they're really saying is Jesus was a Son of God and that other people can become as much the Son of God as Jesus was. That's not Christianity. That is not what we believe. And so ultimately it is, our worship is in and through the story of Jesus because what we believe about Jesus and the truth of his story is foundational to what it means to be a Christian. Okay, is that fair? We also believe that worship is by the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, we can, and this is something that is particularly Protestant, that the Protestant faith since the Reformation has understood that you can go through all emotions in the world. But if the Holy Spirit is not the one motivating that, if, if you do not have the heart feeling that the Spirit would give you, then it is not real. Um, when we, the Catholic Church, for instance, would say that, that the process, that you, when you take communion, you are partaking literally of the body and blood of Christ. It doesn't matter where your head is or your heart is on that particular day, that if you take the thing, if you take those elements, you have received the body and blood of Christ and you have received grace through that. In the Protestant uh, beliefs, we would say that unless the Holy Spirit has inspired you to faith, and faith comes by the, from the Holy Spirit, to believe that as you partake in those elements of, bre of the bread and the cup, that you are in faith receiving them as the body and blood of Christ. So what's happening on the inside by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is critical. Otherwise, it's just you might as well, as an old friend of mine said, he could have communion with hot dog and a Coke in a park. Well, no, I think it's a little, it has to be a little more formal than that if you're taking it seriously. 
but we might as well be having a hot dog broke in a park if the Holy Spirit is not involved in some way affecting us internally. That is, that's part of what we believe. And we are empowered in worship by the Holy Spirit in order that we might live our lives to the glory of God. Now, there is some disagreement in the history of Christianity as to whether the practices, I'm sort of just mentioning that, is whether the practices that we do are sort of an end in themselves or whether they're entirely internal, something that's happening inside, or whether it is some combination of the two. Some Protestant uh, churches, for instance, would say that the sacraments are only symbols. They're symbols of something else. There are others, like the Catholic Church, that would say that they, it, is, it is the body and blood of Jesus Christ, and partaking of that is in itself sufficient. It doesn't matter where you are. Um, well, all churches would say there are means of grace, but in what way? Again, the Protestant faith would say there are means of grace only if you are accepting them in faith. Okay. Uh, and then there's some that are in between, that, that say that the act itself is significant, but is not efficacious for you unless the Holy Spirit is working in you and you have faith. So there are some differences to how all that is played out in terms of belief systems, but, um, and I won't get into the details of, of how the Catholic Church differs in that regard, you know, in terms of the their concept of the reservoir of grace and how that's applied. So we, this is how we understand, and, and it, it, I confess it's a more academic kind of definition than what I've used because I want us to tease some of this stuff apart. As we look at that, I want us to think now about varying styles of worship that have occurred historically. And I'm doing this because I want each of you, I know some of you come from a Catholic tradition, some of you come from more Baptist tradition, you know, etc. I want to talk now about some of the historical varieties of styles of worship, or what we might call styles of spirituality, which I'll explain. And I'd like for each of you, as we talk about these, to identify where you're coming from. And it may be more than one. You may be from a Catholic tradition who then was involved in a Pentecostal tradition or charismatic. Charismatic is the last half of the 20th century influence of the Pentecostal movement, which started in 1907. Um, talk about that. So I think it's important for us to look and see where we are in terms of what we, where we came from, ourselves, because that will give us then an understanding as we think is we're here and think about what others might say. Now let me give you a, a reference for that. Of the many reasons for differences in worship style, and there are many differences, the most important one I believe is the impact of particular cultural and historical situations. From where do we come? And you'll notice I have more styles of spirituality rather than worship styles because in many ways, this we're talking about more than just what actions we do when we get together. We actually are talking about what we understand about ourselves in the presence of God. Because so much of what we do in worship is actually a reflection of our understanding of our place in Jesus Christ and how God interacts with us. Somebody who is Pentecostal, the way that they practice Worship, in a corporate sense, reflects a lot of their understanding about who they are in Christ, as opposed to a Catholic, or an Orthodox, or a Baptist. So it really is, what, but remember, you know, uh, lex orandi, lex credendi, as you worship, so you believe. So this is more than just about what we do, it also reflects what we really believe. It is a spiritual style, in addition to being just a worship style. Make sense? Now let me give you sort of a little scenario. If someone were to grow up in the Midwest and they had been part of a Midwestern Protestant fundamentalist church, I wish my wife were here because I'm describing her almost exactly here. Um, the Protestant fundamentalism in the Midwest was significantly influenced by two, well, by one major uh, source. It came out of the Scandinavian Lutherans. In the Midwest, you have a lot of Scandinavians, right? You know, you have a lot of people from Norway and Sweden, etc. Uh, my wife and her father and most of the people that live in Racine, Wisconsin, are Danish. So they come out of that same Scandinavian Lutheran background. But in particular, Midwestern Protestant fundamentalists come out of the pietist stream of Scandinavian Lutherans. All right? There was a pietist where there was a strong emphasis on personal 
you know, personal conduct in a very um, pious kind of way. There were strict regulations as to what you should and shouldn't do. Even the application of some things like, um, like the Sabbath, maintaining the Sabbath, where you're not allowed to go play games or play cards or do you know any of those kind of things. So there was a, that's that's the influence of the Pietism that came out of that. Well, and it would re reflect things like um, if you come out of that sort of Midwestern uh, Protestant, out of the Scandinavian Lutheran kind of tradition, you would always say prayer before meals. You would always pray before you took a trip. You would kneel for prayer at bedtime and sometimes when you first got up in the morning. Some people would kneel for prayer after meals as part of that. There would be a tradition, a strong tradition of reading the Bible often, usually first thing in the morning. You get up in time to read scripture before you do anything else. You get up, you kneel, you pray, you read the Bible. You would probably have Bible reading as part of a regular family kind of activity. You would go to church twice on Sunday, morning and night, and go to Wednesday night prayer service. Okay. Now, some of you may be from traditions where you've got pieces of this, but um, the, you would not have been baptized as an infant. You would only be baptized as a confessing adult. At a certain point as an adult, you would give your testimony, and you would be baptized, and you would be brought into the church. Now, anybody that comes from that tradition, or any other tradition, would think of that as what it means to be a Christian. Somebody who comes out of that tradition, you talk about infant baptism, which is why I wish Carolyn were here, because she has strong feelings about this. You talk about infant baptism, and they go, absolutely not. You talk about, um, if, you, if you talk about having liturgy in the church, they go, liturgy is for churches that are dead and dying. We don't have liturgy. We worship. Although they might not even use the word worship, because the assumption is so much that this is what it means to be a Christian, that it's a given. And when you hear about churches who do things significantly different than that, there's an inherent tendency to say, what is wrong with those people, whether you'll say that out loud or not. Now where I'm going with that is that every person of faith inherits, or else they're converted into in some cases, a particular style of spirituality, which should reflect in how they live their lives as Christians and also how they worship. And they will, we will all tend to make assumptions that that's the right one. We will make assumptions about what it means to have faith, what it means about how you're supposed to act in the presence of God. And we need to understand that what we consider normative, you know, the, the right way to do things, is not the only way to do things. And that maybe we can learn from some of those traditions. And maybe we need to look critically, and I don't... Not, Critical, I don't mean negatively, I simply mean we need to look seriously and ask questions about some of the traditions that we may make assumptions on. Okay, does that make sense? You follow me so far? Now, again, I want each of you to be thinking as we talk about this, because we're going to talk about some of the his historic antecedents that brought us to the major Protestant traditions that exist today. We're going to talk a little bit later about Catholic renewal and a couple of other stuff, things. But... Um, and I want you to try to identify where you fall in that at the same time that you're recognizing that there are alternatives to where you came from. First, we would start historically with Puritan New England worship. The Puritan worship and, and, and American Protestantism came out of the Puritan movement. It came out of the persecution of Protestants in, in different parts of Western Europe, but especially in England, and the efforts of those people to escape from that persecution by the Catholic Church or by the dominant Protestant uh, churches in some cases. And they came to the New World in order to try to have freedom to worship. Interestingly, in most cases, when they came to the New World, they were not um, willing to be accepting of people who did it differently than them. The, the Protestants in North America, most of them, with a few exceptions, um, were, tended to be very, very judgmental and very negative against anybody who wanted to do it any differently than they did, which is weird since you realize that's what they came out of. Um, and in fact, Pennsylvania was established as a place where, where the people that had been persecuted for their particular religious practices in other states, Massachusetts and elsewhere, that they could come to and that they would have more freedom there. And that was a whole orientation toward that state being founded. Um, so we have, a, we have a weird tradition, uh, history in that regard. But, the Puritan New English worship was the clearest incarnation, if you will, of the Reformation worship that came out of Europe and then moved to the New World. It especially could be identified as focusing on um, the hearing of God's Word. 
Preaching, reading, and scripture was the primary focus. Very simple kinds of, you know, you know how the Puritans dressed, right? Most of them came out of a Calvinist tradition. In the New England villages, there would be a meeting house. The meeting house would invariably be in the center of town for several reasons. One, because, and the meeting house was their church. It was also the community center. It was where they had, you know, the first democracies were the early American, not first democracies, but the purest form of democracy, I would say, uh, was probably the New England meeting house villages because everybody would get together and everybody would have a vote. Today, we in the U.S. talk about having a democracy. We actually don't have a true democracy. We have a republic. We have a democratic republic, which means we don't actually make the decisions in our, in our political system. We elect people who make the decisions. So we vote to have representatives, and those representatives do the work. Well, in New England, everybody had a say in how things were done, and they, they met regularly in the meeting house. Well, that was also their church. The meeting house was always in the center of the village so that everybody had equal access to it. You know, everybody was pretty much equally close to it. And it also meant that on Sunday, since you weren't supposed to travel a long distance on Sunday, there's the, you know, the pietist kind of background, you didn't have to walk very far to go to church. There were not multiple churches to choose from. There was just one. And they, were ten they tended to be, in New England, Calvinist churches. Uh, John Calvin, and Calvin is the source of Reformed theology. That's what we as a Presbyterian church have. Calvin emphasized that all of life, all of life, needed to be structured in such a way that it glorified God, and that worship should be biblical. Now, that sounds so obvious to us, but that actually, the idea that worship needed to be biblical became um, sort of ensconced in what was called the regulative principle of worship. The regulative principle of worship says it needs to be biblical. Now, what does that mean? I'll give you an analogy in the difference between how Martin Luther approached his reforming work and how Calvin and Zwingli and others approached it. Um, and I'll give you the sock drawer uh, definition. Luther did not feel the motivation. Now, Luther didn't even want to stop being a, a Catholic, you know, being forced into. He wanted to try to get the church to change. He wasn't trying to start a new church. But in Luther's case, Luther saw nothing wrong with retaining as many elements as he could of the church that existed, the Catholic church that existed, which is why high Lutheran churches will look pretty Catholic to us, right? Early Lutheran churches especially did. Whereas Zwingli and Calvin, the, the Zwingli was the Swiss reformer during that same time, and then Calvin later on in Switzerland, they believe you start all over again. And the sock drawer analogy is that Luther saw the church like a sock drawer. He opened it up and he looked in and he said, okay, we can take that out and we can take that out and we can take that out and everything else is fine. So he got rid of the stuff he had a particular problem with but kept most of it so that a Lutheran church early on would have looked very much like a Catholic church. Well, the, compared to that, the way that Zwingli and Calvin and some of the other reformers did it, they took the, pulled the sock drawer out completely, dumped it all out in the bed, on the bed, put the sock drawer back in and they said, okay, we will keep that, and we will keep that, and we will keep that. What they chose to keep was very minimal, which is why there were periods of time in Switzerland among the Swiss Protestants that they painted over uh, any, any religious art that was on the walls of their churches. They got rid of statues, they got rid of paintings. You know, they believed we're gonna keep it as plain as possible because there's no indication in the Bible you know, this, the regulative principle of worship, that if it's not biblical, we're not going to have it. So Luther said, if it's not actually getting in the way, it's fine. Zwingli and Calvin and others said, no, if it's not in the Bible, we're getting rid of it. And there were huge issues related to that. So the New England Puritans reflected that kind of approach. They sort of emptied the sock drawer first and only put back the stuff that you really need. And they, so it tended to be very strict. There was a strong emphasis on the fact that your whole life should be lived in service to God, in worship to God, so much so that Calvin in Switzerland, there were periods of time in which he would lock the church in between services. Why did he do that? Because his point was, I don't want people thinking that they're only worshiping when they come to church, that they're only praying when they come in the church building, which was a tendency that had existed before. He wanted them to have the sense that I worship everywhere I am. I sing hymns of praise wherever I am. 
I actually Psalms of praise because Calvin believed only in using the Psalms because that's biblical. There was no new writing of songs for more than 100 years after Calvin. There, there, there were no hymns that were not um, psalms. And the psalms were set to music. In fact, the first book printed in the United States, since we're talking about Puritan New England, the first book printed in the United States was the uh, Bay Psalm Book, where they took the psalms, the Hebrew psalms, translated them to English and set them to music, but they were out of Scripture. But this sense that everything you do, you should be singing hymns of praise while you work, you should be praying in your home. It's not just something you do at church. So there was a very strong emphasis on that. People listened to sermons for entertainment. There weren't any movie theaters. There was no Netflix. You know, they're, they're, they tended to be very somber and not play a whole lot of games. And so it's estimated that a New England Puritan would hear as many as 5,000 sermons in their lifetime. Because that to them, that's everybody knew everybody. Everybody got together for worship. It was a community time. The meeting house was a community hall as well as being church. And so it was a very different kind of thing. In fact, there's, there are accounts that in New England there were times when the community leaders had to restrict the number of sermons being preached in order to get anything else done. Because everybody, somebody would say, oh, I'm going to be preaching on Tuesday afternoon. Everybody show up. Well, I'm going to preach Wednesday morning. Everybody show up. Well, they needed to get work done. And so in certain places they would limit the number of sermons that could be offered. Because anybody who felt they had a message got it. You know, God might want them to share, they would have a tendency to get up and preach. Very different than what we're used to today. You know, if, um, services in the New England uh, Puritan worship tended to last at least three hours. The pastoral prayer would be at least an hour of that. The sermons would be at least an hour of that. And remember, you know, you pastoral prayer, sermons, and the reading of Scripture, there wasn't a whole lot more. We're going to look in a few minutes about the elements of these different things. But it's also true that the average service back then, we think of Puritans as being very somber, everybody knew everybody else. And so they were very interactive and, and apparently very lively. During the sermon, congregation members would comment on it, and there would be an interaction about it. You know, after the scripture was read, people in the congregation would make comments about their understanding of that scripture. And this sort of thing happened all the time. So it wasn't this sort of sit there somber, they were apparently very active community events, which is why I suppose it made it easier to go for three plus hours on these things. Um, this began to establish the model that affected, while it didn't directly carry on, it affected a lot of the worship that came in all of American Protestantism. Now the second style of worship, you may not be familiar with the title, but free church style. This particularly came out of the Anabaptist movement. The Anabaptists, um, Guillermo and I were talking about this last week, the Anabaptists were, and by the way, I have some more to talk to you about on that. Uh, the Anabaptists were a movement that began to emphasize uh, personal faith and personal testimony of adults. So they did not accept or acknowledge infant baptism. They were the ones that really instituted that only believer baptism, that is an adult who professes faith, and then was baptized as a member of the church. The, there was a radical change that occurred, and this, Menno Simons, who's the founder of the Mennonite movement, Michael Sattler, who, uh, and then later on, the pi influenced by pietism, and John and Charles Wesley. You know, Wesley was a, obviously the founder of Methodism, but he was always an Anglican. He was not willing to leave the Anglican church. Methodism developed out of his teaching, but he didn't leave the Anglican church to start Methodism because he wanted to stay in the church. But the, ever since Constantine's time, when the church became legal for the first time, there had been a basic pattern for church. And that is all of the churches, you know, all of the Christians in an area would belong to one church. Later, there would be a senior pastor, who we later started calling bishop, that would be over there. Now, it may be multiple churches, but they would all be organized under one. And that's when they started having bishops. That is, a pastor who they considered to be mature enough or good enough that he could be sort of the head over multiple churches. And then those bishops were connected in a network, and that's where you get the Catholic Church. But with the free church style, the idea came along that there was no parish. There was no central authority. There was no bishop. Every church was freestanding. That's where you get free church. Um, they may have a connection to one another as Christian believers, but there was no structure that tied them together. 
They also, in addition to that, a different kind of uh, structure and the emphasis on the adult believer confessing and being rebaptized, because all of them would, would have been baptized as infants as well. They're coming out of the time when the Catholic Church was there. Um, there was also an emphasis on the church as being the gathered elect who were drawn out of the world. Rather than being, you know, being the church in the world, they were the church drawn out of the world. And so there was a lot of emphasis on them being different than everybody else. And it became, in some cases, fairly isolationist. Um, not in all cases, but in some. So this idea of uh, focus on personal conversion, personal faith, voluntary commitment, those were prerequisites for being rebaptized and therefore prerequisites for church membership and also understood to be prerequisites for true worship. You couldn't be a true worshiper unless you had gone through the process of reconversion, of confession, and then rebaptism and being drawn into the church. Those were necessary for worship. Now, um, everyone was understood because they didn't have central authority. They didn't have bishops. They didn't have priests. They would have ministers. Often those ministers were not officially trained. They were lay ministers, but they were, you know, they felt a calling of God or their, their abilities were acknowledged by the congregation. So they developed a strong sense that everyone should have an equal say in the worship services. If not to actually preach, because that might require a certain gift, here's where you start getting lay people reading the scripture and lay people leading various parts of the worship. That had never happened before. And so much more lay involvement, lay participation, lay leadership. It was out of this free church movement and the emphasis on personal conversion and, and then personal growth that we really developed the idea of small home groups and home Bible studies, things that are done outside the church. Again, because you're, you know, you're the, the, the gathered elect, you are separate from the world, and so this gave you an opportunity to experience that and practice it at home. That influenced the revivalist movement that I'm going to talk about in just a second, and it also became a major theme, this home, home groups, home Bible studies, being part of a, you know, a study group, those things influenced, of course, most mainline denominations. And so we see that reflected. The, the free church style is especially present today in the Baptist churches, in independent Bible churches, the Calvary Chapel movement from the 1970s that Chuck Smith started, the Vineyard Fellowship movement that John Wimber started in the, 19, uh, in the late 70s. And it did lead to some individual recognizable denominations. The Brethren denomination, uh, the Moravian Brethren, those are denominations that really came out of this free church style. But this influenced a lot of different churches. And we can see pieces of that in our own traditions. Okay? Adult baptism, adult confession, no infant baptism, and, um, participating in the church because of personal commitment of faith, an obligation almost to be involved in Bible studies, etc. Those kinds of things. Now, the Scottish Presbyterians... Similarly to the free church movement, they moved away from parishes toward this idea of being the church called out of the world and, and gathered independently, individually. And they also began a revival movement in the Scottish Presbyterian churches. They would have, once a month or so, they would have what they called a holy fair, which would be a weekend or a couple of days where people would gather for extended periods of time in order to you know, emphasize their, uh, their call to be holy before God, especially in preparation for communion. So out of that and some other pieces, we developed the third style I mentioned, which is revivalism. This is a, this, while it began in Europe, most things did, it's a particularly American church style in which all the liturgical elements tend to be focused toward prompting conversions. If not conversion, then recommitment of one's life. You guys have been there, right? Um, the revivalism especially characterized American Christianity starting in the early 1800s. Charles Finney was a very popular, you know, well-known preacher. He would have been one of the superstar pastors of his day in the early 20s, um, 1820s. He began to focus the worship service entirely on leading people to commit themselves to Christ, either to be converted the first time or to recommitment their, their lives. And everything he put in the public worship of his church was geared toward that. There would be public confessions of faith, either somebody who's come to Christ or somebody who's returned to Christ. Uh, altar calls. This is where the altar call came from, this revivalist movement. 
where you invite people to come forward. I personally am grateful for this because I was saved on like the 27th verse of Just As I Am in a Southern Baptist Church in East Tennessee. Um, of extended meeting times. You know, the buses will wait, <laughs> as Billy Graham used to say. We're not going to rush this thing. It will take as long as it takes for people to make the decision. They even had a thing in Charles Finney's church, which became popular, which was called the Anxious Bench. In the front of the church, there would be a pew. And I can remember this in the Baptist church. They didn't call it the Anxious Bench. But anyone who was really feeling God calling them and they were struggling with this and didn't know what to do and they wanted somebody to pray with them would come up and sit on the bench, the pew in the front row, right? You guys ever had that? Well, Finney called that the anxious bench because people were feeling anxious because the Holy Spirit was, you know, working on them. Um, so all of these kinds of things, along with a lot of prayer, of congregational singing, of testimonies, big emphasis on testimonies of conversion and of recommitment, the altar call, etc. Those were aspects of the revivalist movement. Now, in the late 19th century, late 1800s, the revivalist movement split in two. Not formally, but just sort of over time. Half of it became the, the suburban, mainline churches. And those churches can be recognized. I always think of Carolyn's father's church in uh, Wisconsin when I think of this. If you go in a church and you walk in and there are these lounges that have sofas and chairs and it sort of looks like somebody's living room and then you go in and the, you know the pews are really padded and they're meant to be comfortable well when the revivalist churches some of them began to move into the suburbs when people started moving to the suburbs you know at the uh, in large populations we're not in the cities anymore um, these churches were intended to be sort of like Come to church like you're visiting somebody's house. You're going to a friend's home. And they were even laid out in ways that felt like that, where they had lounges and sofas, and you could sit and talk, have coffee, you know, coffee hour, fellowship time, those kinds of things. So that was half of where the revivalist movement went. The other half were the churches that tended to stay in the urban centers. They became the urban churches, and they, many of them stayed there for the specific reason that they saw a huge human need in the cities. And they saw the need to address that. There was hunger, there was lack of education, there was poverty, there was poor housing. Well, out of that half, or that part of the social, the revivalists, we developed, they developed what they call the social gospel, which has become a bad word to most evangelical or fundamentalists, the social gospel. But it was an emphasis in those urban churches to meeting the very practical needs of people. Both of those two came out of the revivalist kind of movement in America. Now, another thing that happened, and almost in a, the next development in this revivalist movement, is the growth of um, worship styles, especially in the South, but in other places as well, of, uh, and through missionaries. Missionaries carried this kind of style, this revivalist style, all over the world. If you go to Africa now, and you go to a Protestant church in Africa, parts of that will look familiar to you because they'll have a strong emphasis on conversion, an altar call, calling people to come forward. They'll come forward and they'll bow and lay hands on them and pray. And all of this kind of stuff comes out of revivalism. This also is the source for, in the starting in about the 1970s, for the growth of what's called seeker churches. Seeker churches are those, again, remember revivalism was focused on either converting people or getting them to recommit. Seeker churches were an attempt, and Willow Creek in Barrington, Illinois was a big part of this. They were sort of a, a, were and still are a guiding light in the seeker church movement to reinvigorate secular and post-Christian, if you will, American interest in the church. At a time in the 1970s when so many Americans were saying the church is irrelevant, it doesn't do anything for us anymore, there was a movement begun to try to get people to see the church as re relevant. Now what happened, and again Willow Creek um, Hybels and Bill Hybels and Willow Creek really did a lot for this. They began to have, and if you go to Willow Creek today in Barrington, Illinois, it's one of the biggest churches in America. On Sunday morning, they focus on, um, it's, it's a seeker service, it's called. And everything is geared toward people who are not committed Christians. If, they're, if they are Christian at all, they're not very committed. And so they will not use particularly Christian language. They will not present it in such a way that would be similar to what most people would get in church. They are looking to get people to feel like this is relevant. They will use a lot of media. They'll use film clips or drama or plays, skits, sketches. Um, there will be, the sermon will be geared toward somebody who doesn't understand theology very well and doesn't have a background in scripture. 
So the goal is to try to bring people now. And in, in, in Willow Creek, they're what they they call um, Believers Church. I think they call the so-called Believers Church. They have that like on Tuesday night. And the intention is that people who are committed believers who are growing in their faith and really, you know, are are just trying to become more what God wants them to be, but really committed to Jesus, they have a different service for them than what they do on Sunday morning, which is Seeker Church. So there's been a strong move in that direction. Um, this, this whole kind of thing has also affected church architecture. If you go to a very seeker-oriented church, they'll tend to have very wide aisles, so it's easy for people. All of the aisles will focus on the, the, the altar, if you will, although the altar is not seen. In the Old Testament, of course, the altar is where they sacrificed animals. In the uh, Catholic Church, it's the altar because there is the Mass is a re-sacrificing of Christ. Well, in Protestant churches, revivalist-oriented churches, and seeker churches included in that, there's the idea that the altar is the focus of where you come and give yourself to Christ, that you are laying yourself on the altar of Christ. You know, Paul said that. Um, and so there's very much an orientation and actually Christian architecture. Churches, there is a specific kind of direction that revivalism and secret churches and all that have led us to. Um, and you can see it, these sort of semicircular churches, angled seats, wide aisles, all, all rays of the church point toward the altar, if you will, or the altar table, as we might call it. There then, as a reaction against this whole revivalism thing, in the mid-1800s, there was a movement called the Christian Nurture Movement, reaction against revivalism. It advocated, instead of emphasizing a conversion process or a recommitment process, which is, was always understood to be sort of a crisis, people come to a crisis in their life or they hear the message and you know, the Holy Spirit speaks to them and they feel this desperate need, that's why you had an anxious bench, because it was a time of crisis. Well, Horace Bushnell in 1847 wrote a book called Christian Nurture in which he advocated that instead of this sort of crisis conversion emphasis of revivalism, that we instead should be raising children in the church and in the home in such a way that they never realize that they weren't Christians. In other words, they grow up in the faith so much that they are believers, but it's not because they had some crisis of conversion. Um, I remember Garrison Keillor was once interviewed by, um, it was a Christianity Today, this particular interview was by Wittenberg Door, which was a parody Christian parody comedy magazine, but they did some serious interviews. And the guy interviewing, Garrison Keillor, said, when were you saved? And he said, I don't know. And the guy interviewing went, aha! <laughs> As though he got him, you know. And Garrison Keillor said, but I know when I knew. Okay, now he would have been a product of this nurture movement. At some point, he didn't have a particular point in time where he could say, this is when I became a Christian. This is when I committed my life to Christ. This is when I was converted. But he had a certain point in his life as a young adult when he realized, I do believe this. At some point along the way, I came to believe this. That's an example of the nurture movement. Somebody once said the nurture, Christian nurture is a focus on, instead of bringing them in, bringing them up. Raising them in the Christian faith. Well, because of that, the nurture movement, uh, the churches that followed the nurture movement, were some of the earliest churches in America to have Sunday schools. Because Sunday schools was an effort to try to raise children in the knowledge of Scripture. They also especially had renewed interest in catechisms, training children, in the creeds, reciting the creeds, in printed programs, set liturgy, etc. Uh, a lot of this you'll see reflected today in Episcopal churches in America or Anglican churches elsewhere. And, and the Episcopal church is one of the most liberal theologically in America. You know, they have, there's, there's been a huge controversy ongoing because since um, they elected the first bishop who's a practicing homosexual. Well, the Anglican Church worldwide, the Episcopal Church in America is a part of the Anglican Communion worldwide. Overall, the Anglican Communion worldwide is one of the most evangelical, one of the most theologically conservative. The Anglican Churches in Africa, for instance, which is huge, you know, there are more Anglicans in Nigeria, I think, than any other country. They are biblically and theologically very conservative. There are a lot of American Episcopal Churches who don't agree with where the American Episcopal Church has gone, and they now technically are affiliated with the Anglican Church of Nigeria, or one of the African churches. So, uh, but they have tended to emphasize more the Christian nurture, rather than the crisis of conversion. You don't have altar calls in most Episcopal churches. 
We then, the most influential um, worship style of the 20th century was the Pentecostal, was and is the Pentecostal movement. The Pentecostal movement uh, combines a freedom of lay-led worship. Okay, a lot of lay people, in fact, in Pentecostalism, in many places, um, the ministers are not trained theologically. There are some places in the South, for instance, Southern Pentecostal churches, that they don't want somebody who's trained because they think that pollutes them. All right, they want somebody who God has called but has not been influenced by seminaries or advanced education. So lay-led, freedom of worship. There's a still, like revivalism, a strong call to decision, to, to respond to Christ, and, obviously, um, a strong expression of the presence of the Holy Spirit in worship. Now, Pentecostalism has only been around for just over 100 years. It began in 1907 in Los Angeles. There were a couple of churches, especially the Azusa Street Mission. In fact, Pastor William Seymour, an African-American pastor, and was the leader of what was called the Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles. This was where Pentecostalism really began. And it involves especially worship, which has the, uh, the active expression of the ecstatic gifts of the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues, pr uh, prophecy, interpretation of tongues, uh, supernatural healing, and those sorts of things. It, was, it came out of a Wesleyan and Methodist piety. So you, and you see the link between revivalism and that. But the focus was encouraging and experiencing a deeper life in Christ, and it spread all over America and worldwide, again, with missionaries. Um, the focus was filling up the Holy Spirit as a way to be more intimate in your relationship with God. The, because of the early African-American influence and much of a cross-cultural kind of influence in the early Pentecostal movement, this is one of the reasons Pentecostalism has proven to be so popular in other parts of the world, in Latin America, in Africa, parts of Asia as well, but especially Africa and Latin America. The Pentecostal movement is huge. Um, in fact, there are parts of South America where when they say Christian, they mean Pentecostal as opposed to Catholic. Here, when you say Christian, you mean somebody who's not Catholic. But in much of, of South America, uh, Christian means Pentecostal because that is the dominant kind of worship style or church. The Expectation in the Pentecostal movement is that the gifts of the Holy Spirit being expressed, again, tongues, prophesying, healing, uh, interpretation of tongues, that that's normative and that that is to be expressed in regular acts of worship. The liturgy has aspects of revivalism, aspects of free church style, but one of the things that's unusual in, the, in, a, in larger churches, that are Pentecostal churches, is they'll have a space that's especially designed for expressions of of the Holy Spirit being present, dancing in the Spirit, of people being slain in the Spirit in some cases, um, of healings occurring, that kind of stuff. There'll be as part of the church down near front where that sort of thing goes on. If you're not part of that, that sounds very strange to us. There also is an emphasis on raising your hands in worship, of laying on of hands, of singing contemporary music styles, often in scriptures set to music, so they have helped develop that in recent years. Now, out of Pentecostalism, which comes from the first decade of the 1900s, in the last half of the 20th century, this Pentecostal movement began to spread into other traditions, into other denominations, including the Catholic Church. And that was known as the Charismatic Movement. The Charismatic Movement came out of Pentecostalism. You have Catholic Charismatics, Presbyterian Charismatics, Baptist Charismatics, although very few of those, um, and various others, where the Pentecostal expression of worship and faith seeped into all these others. There tends to be, amongst all Pentecostals, including Charismatics, a very strong emphasis on millennial theology. In Joel chapter 2, for instance, he said, you know, uh, in the last days, your old men will see visions, your young men will dream dreams. And so the indication is that the expression, the beginning of the 20th century of the expression of these ecstatic gifts of the Spirit in worship is a sign of the fact that the end times are here. And so there's a very strong um, end time, eschatological and millennial emphasis in these churches. Now, in the 1970s, sort of a, we have what's called third wave Pentecostalism. So you have the Pentecostal movement from the uh, early 1900s. The second half of the 20th century, you have the Charismatic movement, which carried much of that into other churches. And then in the 1970s, a man named John Wimber, Really, he came out of uh, Calvary Chapel. Calvary Chapel was, was founded as uh, a free church movement by Chuck Smith. 
John Wimber had been a leader in Calvary Chapel, but he felt like that was still too restrictive and that he was looking for a greater expression of the Holy Spirit in worship. And he uh, launched the Vineyard Fellowship movement. John Wimber is the, is the founder of Vineyard Fellowship. I actually had John Wimber taught a class that I had in seminary. Yes? What did you call Third Wave? Uh, third Wave. Wave. Third uh. Wave Pentecostalism. And that's the Vineyard movement, and it's John Wimber. Um, and it's still part of Pentecostalism, but uh, Wimber saw five different phases of worship. Each of them intended to, to bring people into a closer relationship with God. In fact, he, Wimber, and I really like this, Wimber defined worship as the pursuit of intimacy with God. I like that. The pursuit of intimacy with God. And I'm going to tell you the five phases in just a minute because I want to go to another slide here. But first, I think we're going to take a break. I actually had a class with John Wimber in seminary. It was supposed to have been team taught by he and David Watson. David Watson was from uh, York Minster in England. He was, they're both charismatic, but uh, uh, David Watson was a PhD in philosophy, brilliant guy. And he had a worship team that they traveled around. They had been to the seminary and I had worked with them um, earlier. And unfortunately, I signed up for the class, a lot of people did. And before he could come here for the class, he was diagnosed with a really aggressive cancer and ended up dying. David Watson did, but John Wimber taught the whole class by himself then, so I had Wimber for that, that class on, uh, on worship, actually. It's five minutes after. Let's take a break for ten minutes. Okay, I want to take this same list now and go a little further in terms of looking at the aspects or elements of worship that each of these has represented so that you can kind of get a, a comparison. Um, first, in the New England Puritan worship, which has influenced a lot of other things, we, they would begin with a blessing by the minister, and a, the blessing would be a welcome and blessing, then a hymn, and then scripture reading, and then the sermon, and again, remember, the sermon could take an hour plus, and then the pastoral prayer, which could take an hour plus, then communion, communion was not done every week, but it was done um, once a month or even once a quarter. And that's passed down, for instance, I know the Baptist church I used to go to, they have communion the fifth Sunday of the month, which means there's five Sundays once a quarter. So you have communion four times a year. Um, and I'm wanting to go the other direction. I want to have communion more often. So um, we'll see. And then a hymn, and then a blessing. Very simple. But it had to be simple because even then it would take three hours because you would have an hour worth of preaching and an hour worth of scripture or a prayer and then the other pieces of it. And the hymns would always have been psalms that were said in these. Then the main uh, free church really is the best line to saying mainline Protestant churches. Now there are, there are always elements of others, but this you'll recognize this kind of outline. Um, an initial call to worship, and then a confession. There shouldn't be a slash in there, I don't think. Um, a hymn, a creed and or reading of scripture, then the sermon, the pastoral prayer, communion, a hymn, and then a blessing or sending out. We use the benediction, for instance, as a sending out. Um, you then have the revivalist style. You'll see pieces of this. Very simple. Opening prayer, you would have a praise time, which is congregational singing. Then you would have a testimony. Remember, revivalist is all oriented toward people being converted. And so you'd have somebody testify to their own conversion experience to encourage it. You would have a sermon. The sermon would be geared specifically toward conviction of sin and people recognizing their need to come to Jesus to be saved. And then an invitation or an altar call, it's sometimes called. They, in, in some of the writing of the day, they would refer to that as the harvest of souls, where people would... Come forward, and that would be the end of the service because people coming forward, then you'd be praying with those people and all that kind of stuff. Um, you do see that kind of thing still. I mean, that was that was closest probably to the Baptist Church, Southern Baptist Church that I grew up in. Um, didn't grow up in that I started attending in high school and was saved at. You then get the seeker services I talked about, which come in the 20th century: a welcome and prayer, a praise time. And this is where, really, they began to refer to this as worship. Worship was the singing, as opposed to the other things. Worship became the word that was used for the, 
choral singing, which was led by the, uh, a worship band often. It was the seeker services that, starting in the 1970s, that really developed this idea that you have multiple singers, multiple instrument players leading congregational worship. Um, often in the seeker services, you would have some sort of presentation then, a, a drama, a sketch, sketch being a short drama piece, a media clip, film, you know, whatever. Um, then you would have a sermon and then an invitation. Now the invitation might be an invitation to Christ or it might simply be an invitation to get involved in the church. The life of the church, the activities of the church. Because again, this is oriented toward getting people in who aren't Christian, who don't have a sense of being church people. And the, the goal is to have a low threat, low hurdle kind of uh, experience so that people will be encouraged and inclined to continue. Not a lot of Christian, Christian language very, uh, you know, very open. That's why the seeker emphasis. And then in Pentecostalism, I'm sorry, this is cut off. Shoot, I hate that. I'll tell you what it says. In Pentecostalism, now this is third wave Pentecostalism. This is John Wimber's creation, which I think is fairly reflective of all of what Pentecostalism was shooting for. But Wimber created a five phase approach to worship. All of it intended to increase the uh, experience, or I'm sorry, to increase a sense of intimacy with God. So the pursuit of intimacy with God is the goal of worship. The first part of the worship would be an invitation phase, which is calling all the people to worship. It's like a call to worship, but it, there's a lot. The focus here is on the congregation. There will be a lot of clapping. There will be, you know, it'll be uh, your getting people energized, you're getting them up, you're getting them energetic. And the focus is on the congregation getting ready for the presence of God. So the call, sort of the call to worship, the invitation phase. Second would be the engagement phase in which you approach God. You, rec you, you begin to turn the focus off of the congregation and getting them energized and begin to engage with God's presence. The third phase is called the exaltation phase, in which there is praise offered to God, usually, usually in song. Now, all of these things, you know, there's very singing that occurs throughout all this. The exaltation phase would be songs that focus entirely on God, but especially on exalting Him, on talking about God's greatness, on His power, and His being Lord and King. So there's the exalting of God. Still, at this point, you've still got quite a bit of energy. Then you begin to sort of begin to be more subdued. You get to the adoration phase, where instead of focusing on God's transcendence, that is His greatness, and exalting Him, you start talking about His eminence, His closeness, that He, you know, He is the lover of souls, that He is our Savior, that He is for us. So, and that's quieter. You're beginning to get more intimate with God, and so you're calming down some. And then, the last phase, which you cannot see, sorry, is the intimacy phase, in which after exalting God, having adoration for God in His imminence, you then rest in God's presence, which is the intimacy phase. So those five phases, invitation, engagement, exaltation, adoration, and intimacy. Starting the invitation phase, big focus on the congregation itself and getting them energized and focused and, you know, all pointing the same direction and clapping and, you know, and calling out all kinds of stuff. And then engagement, where you begin to turn the focus away from the congregation and toward God. Exaltation, exalting and praising God for His glory and His greatness and His power. Adoration, focusing on God's eminence, His closeness, His love, His affection for us. And then intimacy which is the quietest of all, where you are resting in God's presence, you are experiencing the presence of God in a calm way. That was John Wimber's approach, which is reflective of the Pentecostal background. Any questions about any of that? Yes. Okay. And this, is this the guy that you took the class from? Yes. In this, uh, it, is, there's room for a sermon or no room yes. for a sermon? Yeah, there would be a sermon in there. I mean, there's all the other elements, but he... he this is his focus, and then, like the invitation phase, they would welcome people and, and then start the sort of generating the energy kind of process. I mean, it really is just that. It's, it's getting people excited. Then engagement and approach to God, um, you, would, you very likely would have the reading of Scripture, and Scripture would be oriented more toward, you know, you're beginning to focus on God now. 
Uh, then when you get into the exaltation kind of thing, uh, you could have a sermon in the exaltation phase or the adoration phase, depending upon the focus of the sermon. I mean, the, the order of worship can vary. But then intimacy would be the time of quiet prayer. Um, the, the exaltation is likely to be the place where you would have the pastoral prayer because you're calling on the greatness of God to intercede for us. Depending upon the approach, you could also do that under adoration. So the various pieces of this, in terms of an order of worship, can fit in anywhere. But there is, this is the flow. You know, the idea that people come in and, you know, and you, you really want to kind of generate a high level of enthusiasm for the congregation being there and clapping and, you know, rah-rah kind of thing. And then you, you engage with the presence of God, you focus on His transcendence, you begin to quiet as you focus on, on adoration, and then you're very quiet as you recognize the presence of God. You know, and this could take an hour and a half. And then there'll be various elements oriented toward that. Okay? So all of these, you begin to see, and, and there's crossover. I mean, in our church, for instance, we have various pieces of all of this. But I've had the experience, you know, uh, from time to time, I will have um, an altar call. You know, I'll have people close their eyes. I, and I may not ask them to come down front, but I will, based upon the sermon and everything else, I will say, you know, if there's anyone here who has not accepted Christ, who do not count him as their Savior, um, then today is the day, you know. Now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. And from time to time, I've had people, you know, who are, who want to come to Christ raise their hands. While every, all eyes are closed, you know, very Baptist, I mean, with every eye closed and every head bowed, you know, anyone who, for the first time, wishes to commit their life to Jesus Christ, raise your hand. And it's very funny, one couple in the church, and they've been involved in the church probably their whole lives. Um, one of the first times I ever did that, the guy, the man raised his hand. And I thought, oh, well, his wife is there going, what? <laughs> he thought I was saying, who really wants to be serious about recommitting their life to Christ? It's not like he was getting saved for the first time. His wife of 40 plus years is thinking, what? <laughs> you know? Um, so you get a different thing. But I, um, from time to time, I'll do that. The, the times I have, people go, why? either, some people go, it's kind of weird. Other people go, well, it's about time. You should be doing that every week. Well, you get a very clear sense of what traditions they come from based upon their reaction to that. Well, our area here is so diverse. Mm -hmm. And it's not like you have staunch Presbyterians here and that, that at the Baptist Church they have staunch Baptists. I mean, some of them are, but right. really, I mean, I know our church is everything from Church of Christ to Charismatic. Same all, thing here. You know, and I'm sure it's the same here. And so, um, yeah, it's sort of hard to, to please everyone. <laughs> well, and that's why, you know, and, and fortunately, our goal isn't to please people. <laughs> it's, it's to get them to where they need to be. But it's just, I, I just recognize that when people make comments like that, they're an example of people coming from a tradition and not realizing that theirs is not the only tradition. And that while the, certainly there are, all of these have something to recommend them, there are certain aspects of all of these that have significant strength. There also are some problems with some of them. Um, the, uh, I, the idea of revivalism being entirely oriented toward a conversion thing, well, where do you, you know, where do we go for growth? You know, where do we go for encouragement and nurture? I think that the, I think that the worship service needs to have some of that too. It's not either or. And that's why I, I will do that from time to time if I feel like the, you know, the, the scripture, if I feel like I'm being led to that you know, by the scripture, by the sermon topic, whatever. Um, I don't feel an obligation either to do it all the time or to never do it. Mm -hmm. Because I think if you lock yourself in, either way, you're not open to what God is telling you needs to, needs to be done. Uh, so. Before we moved here, I was very involved in a church that was um, very growth-oriented. You know, yes, they had altar calls and things like that, but they also had altar calls where people that, like this gentleman, you know, he's just wanting to say, yes, God, I want to give you more of me or whatever. And so the, the altar was very much used. And then, and then in the church that we're in now, somehow the sermon always comes back to if you don't know Christ as your Savior. 
And sometimes that's very Baptist. That, I'm not grateful. It for is. That. Yeah. It is. And and I have to remember that you know I don't come from that background, and so. Um, but sometimes I sort of clash with that because although I realize there's a need for it, I also see. Well, <coughs> I believe you know most 95% of us sitting here are Christians and have dedicated our life to God, and and so what is there beyond? Yeah. Beyond that. Who are you aiming at? I mean, yeah, there there actually is a book. I can't remember the title. Carolyn read it, and I read part of it. <laughs> I got too many books to read. Um, and they, they went, the two guys who wrote this book went way too far. They said that the church is wrong when it evangelizes. That the church, the New Testament model of the church, was encouragement for people who were already believers. Oh, I agree. And, and so, uh, and it's a very popular Christian book. And that, that evangelism is not supposed to be the primary work of the church. That we as individuals should be evangelizing. But that the church should be for the nurture and growth and discipleship of the believers. And that when the church is... The focus all, and I, I, I tend to agree that churches that focus all the time on, on salvation, on altar call, on calling, you know, the harvest of souls, that they've gone too far. Because again, 95% of the people, if, if the fact, the very fact that they're in church that day means that they're, that's not, you're not talking to them if you're asking them to, to come to a saving knowledge of Christ. And so we have to balance it. And I, you know, I look at this list and there are all sorts of pieces of this that I think we incorporate and I, you know. I'm always praying about reviewing and what do we do. Um, I, I don't make many changes to our order of worship. In fact, almost never. I, I'm seriously considering as we get into the new year what we're going to do. But um, because I think I have, I'm very intentional about what the elements are. For instance, some people don't understand um, a woman who became a Christian in our church, who's a friend. She said, I've been coming to church, you know, I, I, she, she called me one Tuesday and said, I've decided to give my life to Jesus, and she's a good friend. They had just started attending the church. And so, later on, after a few weeks, she said, you know, I keep listening to the scriptures that are being read and everything, and I'm thinking, what does that have to do with the sermon? And what does that have to do with whatever? And I go, oh, we use the Revised Standard Lectionary, which means every week we have a responsive reading, which is 95% of the time is taken from the Psalms or Proverbs, okay, where people participate in the antiphonal reading, the responsive reading. We always read an Old Testament passage, we always read a New Testament passage, and then I will read the Gospel passage for that week. And then in addition to that, I will use whatever scripture verse for my sermon. Now, sometimes I may use one of the other passages as my sermon text, particularly the Gospel. But I said, those things are not linked the goal is, I, and, I, and I said I believe, and a lot of people will believe, that scripture, hearing scripture in itself is a critically important thing for us, that it is transformative. And too many people don't, are not reading the scripture on their own, so the fact that over a period of a three-year time period, you know, the, the, the uh, Revised Standard Lectionary, in a three-year period you will hear most, not all, but most of the whole Bible read. You'll hear the Old Testament, you'll hear the New Testament, you'll hear the Gospels read multiple times. Um, and that's why we do it. And I said, it doesn't have to be linked to anything else. By itself, it is important as, as an act of worship. So, uh, but not everybody understands that. You know, some people are thinking, and I, there was a fellowship in Guadalajara that I was asked to come and preach a few times. And the only scripture they had in the whole service every week, at least the weeks I was there, was the scripture I used for my sermon. Everything else was singing. Okay? There was singing, there were a couple of prayers. The focus was on worship time, singing. And again, worship was synonymous with singing. And then if I, if there was gonna be a scripture read, I was gonna have to read it as part of my sermon. So I have a very different idea than that. I think that we need more than that. It's not all about people feeling good by singing, you know, because that's the sense I got there. It uh, doesn't mean I don't believe in worshiping in song at all. Um, it, or, you know, listen to somebody preach. There are more pieces than that that can be transformative for us. In fact, that's one of the things is the idea when we talk about elements of worship. It has always been a belief that there are certain actions that we can take that by doing them, you know, we, we talk about the fact that we're being by worship or being made more in the form of Christ, that there are transformative acts we can do. That 
as long as we do them in faith. I mean, they can be meaningless if we do them without a sense of faith or that we don't do them in obedience, for instance. If we're just doing them because, well, I go to this church and this church does that stuff, then that's a problem. But if we do them in obedience, if we do them in faith, then the reading of Scripture, the participating in the responsive reading, the participation in the prayer of confession, um, all of those things can be themselves transformative acts. And so we should have that idea that the pieces of worship should be things that those who participate in them, those who are in the congregation, if we're talking corporate, that they can be, if they approach them with faith, things that change them in a good way. All right? And that's, that's the criteria that I set for what do I want to have in our worship services. And having established that, I have to have pretty strong motivation to change that. Our, our order of worship is pretty much the same, you know, from week to week. I'm very open to suggestions, and I'm very open to God saying to me, I want you to do something different here. But, you know, we, we say, <clears throat> the first Sunday of every month, we have communion. The second Sunday, we use the Apostles' Creed in that same time period. The third Sunday of every month, we use the Nicene Creed. Often, <clears throat> not as much lately, but the fourth Sunday, we will have a, a testimony of some kind during that time. And I've not done that as much lately, and I need to change that. I need to go back to that. Um, we always do the Revised Standard Lectionary. The responsive reading uh, is, is antiphonally done, Old Testament, New Testament, um, the Gospel. We always have a prayer of confession. It's an answer. Yep. Um, where someone leads that. And we give people a, you know, a moment of silence in the middle where they can confess their own private sins. So all of those, I believe, are transformative actions as people participate. Now, somebody can sit out there and not listen, not pay attention, not care, not, <coughs> not seek God in that. And it's not going to mean anything to them. But isn't that true for anything? Well, what, what is your take on the seeker services? Um, I, I've been to a couple of these. Have you guys had any, any of you guys been to that? Yeah. My father attends a church that's a secret church. Mm -hmm. And the first time I went, it took me back a bit because the pastor spoke mostly about what Dr. Phil had talked about that week on his show <laughs> and never mentioned the Bible. And I was like, oh my gosh. But then I had never heard about seeker service, you know, and so then later I understood the secret. My father doesn't go to the Tuesday believers, you know, meeting, and so I'm like, okay, where are they getting more of this? So talk to talk to us a little bit about. That. Well, I think you're, I think you've hit the nail on the head. Um, it's in recognition, I believe, of that concern that churches like Willow Creek, or I really think, are trying to be thoughtful about this. Why they have multiple services that are geared toward different people, and they will say, if you are a committed believer in Jesus Christ, then this is not the service for you. Okay, don't come on Sunday morning. Come on Tuesday night. And they'll be very blunt about that. Um, so that if there's any confusion, then it's on, you know, the people are doing it to themselves because I think they're very clear. Unfortunately, many churches who call themselves secret churches, that's all they do. They don't have an alternative. Yeah, I don't know if they had an alternative uh, or not. And then knowing the Bible and being in the church for many years, I could hear Christian themes and definitely Christian themes within the sermon right. or the motivational speech that he gave or whatever, but um, there was no reference back to that. And yeah. I think as, I don't know, I, I, I struggle with that. I do too. I, I, and I think um, as a rule, I think there are other ways to approach them. The idea being that people who aren't not Christian, who don't know the church, who are not part of the church, I think I mentioned in, in, I think it was this class, that after, right after I preached a sermon, in fact, it was Sunday afternoon, after I preached a sermon here where I said, we're going to start doing things in our church to, to attract people who are not church people. We're going to have an art gallery. In fact, we've decided we're going to call it the Paloma Gallery and Cafe, Paloma being Dove mm -hmm. in Spanish. Okay. Um, we're going to have movie nights. We do it once a month already. We're going to do it more often than that and do classic movies, that sort of thing, and popcorn and whatnot. We're going to have probably Monday night football or whenever they show football now. I don't even know. I haven't watched football in so long. Um, we're, we're planning to have all kinds of act activities and events that are not church events so that people can come here. And as I told our session, and they completely affirmed this, I agreed with it, I said, I want people to come here and go, wow, that was fun. This is, a, this is a great place. 
you know, these are nice people. Uh, I'm going to come back next week when they're doing the blah, blah. The idea being, and I said, the first six times somebody like that comes in our church, they may not have any real sense of the Christian character of this place and then why we exist, but the seventh time they will, or the ninth time, or the third time. Well, that sounds almost like taking this idea and flip-flopping it. That Sunday is dedicated to Absolutely. the Lord, and then we're going to do some other things. We're not going to call our worship service. That's, um, you know, and that's, why, that's exactly right, and that's why we're doing that. I don't want us to be a secret church, which means we're oriented entirely toward people who don't, even, don't know the language. We can't really read the Bible. We can't do any of those sorts of things. That's not why we meet. But we will have other opportunities to attract people, to draw them in, to make them feel as though this is, this is something I want to get involved in. This is something I, I want to participate in. Which is trying to address the same issue, I, I believe. Uh, I think the secret churches, some of them I know are, like Willow Creek, are working very hard to try to have a balance. Some of the other secret churches, and I confess I don't know a lot about them, but what I've read about some of them that are entirely seeker-oriented, I think they're missing it. I think they're missing it big time. I think they have people coming there who are not... Well, Paul talks about milk and meat. The milk of the gospel is for the people who are not ready yet, with regard to spiritual things, to chew solid food. And he talks about, to some of the people he's writing to, I have to give you milk because you're not ready for the hard stuff. <laughs> and then others meet, which means they are they're ready to deal with the, the serious aspects of Scripture and of God's call to us and what it means to live out our lives that way and of dealing seriously with theological issues, for instance. Um, and I think that if everything you do is milk, then you're missing it. You know, you, that's not, I don't think that's what we're called to be. I certainly so. think it does have its place. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I, I, I mean, when I preach to our congregation, I try not to use highfalutin theological kind of language. I try to make it something that people can, you know, wherever they are in that process, can relate to, but still have it be meaningful. Um, and I don't think that, you know, when, when we have the prayer of confession or when we have response or reading or whatever, I don't think we leave anybody wondering what the heck is going on, right? We try to make sure that everybody's keeping up. But beyond that, you know, the, so that's where we're coming from, okay? Question, uh, Chris first. Just a comment. I, I don't know much about secret services, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me that your church is on that. Having said that, though, and trying to witness to people here who... You know, my experience is a lot of the people that are here are really, you know, they're they're not Christian. They're they'll never want to be Christian, and they don't like Christians so much. So I think like what you're planning on doing is a good step. Mm -hmm. But I sometimes wonder if they, you know, a lot of these people go to open circle because they gather and there's something interesting. Well, not that I would suggest that, but I can see a secret service. It's just separate from the regular service. At some point where you're inviting those people that, and they feel safe. That's why I do the Friday back. lectures. The what? The Friday yeah, lectures. Well, that's what I was going to say. That's exactly this thing. And, I, and I'm pretty sure from the people I've talked that, that have gone to, that they're effective. You know, they, it, it, it gives them a, a, you know, they can kind of rub up against church without having it. Right. In their face. And we've had a few people from the Friday lectures who were not going to church anywhere who've started coming here. Yeah. You know, and and I don't expect there to be, you know, an eighty percent conversion rate from the Friday lectures that I do to you know to church. But I'll I'll take one Absolutely. or two or three. It's worth doing for that. Well, you know, I said I had been there before and then went back. Um, I've seen growth over the last ten years in the secret church. The first time I went it was just water. You know, and then as it's moved up, it, it, it's getting, you know, maybe some curves in it. Yeah, I think, I, think, I think we have a responsibility to do more than just be pablum to everybody. Lynn, you had your hand up. Yeah, uh, Chris, you really are on the same way, way like as I am. Uh, to see the um, effect this church structure, uh, meaning not necessarily the others, but the, the, the people and the fact that it is so community oriented. Uh, it's really touched the community. A lot of people say to me, what are you doing over there now? You know, because we have our Friday lectures and they come and they love them. And when are the next ones? And what are you talking about? And what else are you doing? And uh, I said, oh, we're going to be working with uh, the government's computer program. But wow, that's a great service to the community. And 
a great use of your building and stuff like that. Why do people do that? I said, well, don't ask me why more don't. But it's the fact that we practice what we believe or we try to practice what we believe in service to others uh, and caring for ourselves right. uh, that has really brought the, uh, the dynamics of the church from being something uh, ritualistic inside the structure to something that is it, vibrant. And I think, you know, we currently, I'm doing a series of sermons now in preparation for the finishing of our building because the main reason for this building is so that we do have a base from which we can do other things. I'm preaching um, a series of sermons from Matthew 25 when Jesus said, I was hungry and you fed me, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink, I was in need of clothing and you clothed me, I was sick and you visited me, I was, I was in prison and you visited me, I was sick and you took care of me. And I say, when did we see you like that? Well, as much as you did in one of the least of these, you did it for me. Every one of those, along with the other place where Jesus said, talks about children, you know, um, the, let the little children come to me. Every one of those we see as a mandate for our church. You know, the, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. We, we have, and, and Lydia's involved with the, um, we have two kinds of dry food distribution now. As soon as the commercial kitchen in the back is done, we are going to have hot food preparation and distribution. Um, thirsty, we're talking about spiritual thirst especially in that regard because we'll deal with somebody who doesn't have access to clean water, we'll deal with that under our feeding program. But the, the effort to try to communicate with people who have spiritual needs. I was a stranger and you invited me in. We have a program that Guillermo is working with right now and others in the Spanish language congregation to reach out to South American refugees in, on the, who live on the streets of Guadalajara. Plus, we're starting a welcome wagon kind of thing for people who come to our community. So we're reaching out to strangers and inviting them in and making them know this is a good place for them. Um, we're going to have an infirmary here. I was sick and you took care of me. We will have an infirmary and volunteer doctors providing medical care and medicines here. Um, and in addition to a visitation program for people who are housebound because of illness or in the hospital. Um, I was in prison and you visited me. We have two women in our church who already are involved in regular visitation of the women's prison. We are launching that program in a large way to help provide for them. The women in prison in outside Guadalajara, Punta Grande, they don't have sheets on their bed. They don't have shampoo. They don't have soap. They don't have toilet paper. They don't have any of those things. So we're going to be visiting them. We're going to be providing for their basic needs. We're going to be sharing the gospel with them in very appropriate ways. Uh, we're really kicking that off in a big time right now. Every one of those things that Jesus said, we see as a mandate for us to be doing that ministry. And we are doing it. Um, and we're not, they're not all going to, you know, we're not going to come out of the chute at 100% speed on all of them right away, but we're starting and we will grow every one of those. And so I think that once we are up and running, I've already had people, I had somebody come who I don't know come up to me yesterday at the Thanksgiving event and say, I, I love to cook. And Lydia's offered as well. And I'd love to be able to help prepare food for, you know, people who need or events like the one we had yesterday or whatever. So I think the more of that we are also doing and being visible in doing, that will attract people as well. They may come in the door for the, the sort of social gospel kind of things, but if they're here very long, they're going to hear about Jesus. So so let me keep going. I've got about 12 more minutes. I've got a couple more slides to do. The contemporary situation. There has been in the 20th century two major historical events or factors that have greatly influenced modern approach to worship. The first one is the liturgical renewal in the Catholic Church. The charismatic renewal in the Catholic Church, for instance, was, would be part of that, but this actually began before that. Um, in 1909 in Belgium, a priest named Lambert uh, Baudouin started really making a lot of noise about the need to include the laity in participating in worship. Prior to that, prior to the, to the 20th century, the lay were not involved at all. In fact, the historic understanding of the Catholic Church is that the, the church proper, with a capital C, are those in holy orders. They're the priests and the monks and etc. And that the lay people just get to sort of go along for the ride. That's why the Catholic Church historically had not offered communion in both kinds, meaning that the people were only given the, the bread of communion. Only the priests could participate in both kinds, the bread and the cup. Um, well, starting in the early 1900s, uh, with this Father Baudouin and others beginning to pick up this theme, this message, 
it led to, in 1961 to 65, was the Second Vatican Council, Pope John XXIII called. And it's interesting that when they elected John XXIII as Pope, they thought he was just going to fill, he was older, he was just going to fill the place until they elected a Pope later. Surprise, surprise, John XXIII did more to, re to reform the Catholic Church than maybe anybody since Gregory the Great, I don't know. Um, and they decided, uh, out of the Second Vatican Council, that the church was redefined as being the whole pilgrim people of God. It's no longer the doctrine of the church that it is only the, those in holy orders that, that officially are part of the church. It, they also determined out of the Vatican Council that there should be a, and I'm quoting, full, active, and conscious participation in the liturgy by the whole church. So that began to lead to more and more lay involvement in various ways. It led to a number of lay spirituality movements. It led to uh, programs of study, Catholic studies in various universities, Catholic and not Catholic, for instance at, at um, Notre Dame, um, Seattle University in Seattle is a, is a Catholic school where they began to actually study for lay people to study things like worship and to study things like Catholic theology, which had previously been only under the auspices of the, the people in orders, priests and monks. Um, and there was a development of a whole new group of Catholic spiritual writers, Thomas Merton, Henri Nouwen, and various others. Interestingly enough, this Catholic renewal led to a great renewal amongst Protestants in spirituality. In effect, the Protestants, once the Catholic Church was more open, and once they started having people like Nouwen and Merton and others writing spiritual works that everybody was blessed by, Protestants started rediscovering aspects of spiritual tradition that they had completely lost before. The Protestants had completely forgotten about Things like Ignatian spirituality, the spiritual, um, uh, spiritual lessons of St. Ignatius and St. Benedict and others. Uh, the idea of pilgrimages, of processions, of uh, Taizé spirituality, which is, uh, Taizé is a community in Burgundy in France that they, they also have music they've written, they have worship order. It was founded by a Protestant uh, brother and it's an ecumenical. There are Protestants and Catholics and Orthodox who are all part of this but a strong emphasis on spirituality, on an awareness of the body of Christ worldwide. All of this came out of this liturgical renewal in the Catholic Church. And so it was very significant, and it continues to be very significant. Uh, there no longer is the absolute firewall between Protestants and Catholics with regard to spiritual matters. Okay? And I know you've been involved in, the, in praying the labyrinth, and the, that's another mm -hmm. thing the Protestants have discovered, which came out of Catholic spirituality. Uh, exactly. Yes. Just a, a the comment on the positive side, I was in vets one day, and the vets said, what was I studying, so I told him, and he said his sister had just graduated with a degree in theology, Catholic Church in Guadalajara. Okay, very good. And yep. that really surprised me. That's very new. I mean, that, that's that we may not be aware of that, but that's only been in the last 100 years that there was any consideration of that. And it's only been in the last 50 years or so that the opportunity has really been there since mm -hmm. the 1960s well, with the, the, the Second Vatican Council. Well, the fact that she was a woman that was uh, Catholic Church and she had no notion of taking orders of any kind. Right. So that's one major historical movement that has really led to renewal, not only in the Catholic Church, but amongst Protestants as well. I mean, I'm, I'm, I've been very influenced by the writings of Thomas Merton and Henri now and others. Um, and then the second is the revival of evangelical Christianity after World War II. Um, prior to that, we didn't even call ourselves evangelicals. They, they were fundamentalists. But primarily, there was a movement after World War II for those who were fundamentalist, conservative Christians to begin to have a greater engagement with the broader culture. Um, and you, if you know anything about Christian organizations or activities at all, the number of organizations and, and ministry efforts that began in the 1940s and 50s and following are really significant. Uh, some of these are actually part of the end of the First World War, but Young Life, the organization, began in 1941, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship in 1941, Youth for Christ in 1946, the Billy Graham Crusades were launched in 1947. Christianity Day magazine was launched in 1956. All of this stuff, and in fact, the whole divine, uh, the, the definition of evangelical as a category of Christians. An evangelical, and I are one, so I'll let you know, there's a historical definition. Um, theologically, in terms of, well, scriptural theology, I probably, you know, I've had people ask me, well, how are you different than a fundamentalist? You know, and they say that with sort of uh, as a negative. 
Um, the, 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 the first fundamentalists were highly trained academic theologians. It came out of Princeton Seminary, B.B. Warfield and those guys. They wrote a document called The Fundamentals, which identified what the basics of the faith. Well, when that sort of came from Princeton, New Jersey, and when it got into the South, they started seeing education as being a negative. The difference in fundamentalism and, and um, evangelicalism, because the evangelicals wanted to have a greater, um, a greater engagement with broader culture, evangelicals and fundamentalists will have basically the same theology, generally speaking, about scripture and about the, the nature of Jesus Christ and about salvation and all that. But evangelicals have had a historical focus on education being a good thing, that being educated is an advantage. Granted, in education you can sometimes get wrong messages, but overall evangelicals have supported higher education and fundamentalists have not, at least not since the early days. And secondly, evangelicals have taken very seriously our responsibility to ecology, to social causes, um, whereas fundamentalism hasn't. So an evangelical is a fundamentalist with a brain and a heart. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not saying that fundamentalists, no fundamentalists do. But, um, and again, Christianity Magazine, Billy Graham, you know, etc. Uh, sort of define what for us, and this is only in the last half of the 20th century that this has really happened. And then in the 1970s and 1980s, evangelicalism began to create a new approach to structure of church and to worship. Uh, in the 70s and 80s, especially the 70s, there was a movement called the New Paradigm Churches, where they were doing church completely differently, both how they were structured, how they worshiped, how everything about it. Um, I mentioned earlier the Calvary Chapel movement in Southern California. It came out of the Jesus movement, and Chuck Smith, the founder of Calvary Chapel, was, was influenced by that. And there was a big focus there in adapting the, the good parts of American culture into the Christian scene. That was where contemporary Christian music came from. The idea that, can, that Christian worship music didn't have to be older hymns. You could take modern kind of music and use the right kind of words and that could be a, a way, a means to worship. And the 1980s, that whole thing, and Calvary Chapel is really seen as where contemporary Christian music kind of got its start in terms of worship music. And then 1980s, Contemporary Christian music achieved a level of success and visibility that it became a major, a significant factor in mainstream music. The mainstream music industry, contemporary Christian music is a huge part of the music industry today. Um, I can remember when, you know, for six bucks you could go see an Amy Grant concert. Not so much anymore, you know. Um, and it, it began to have a, at that point, a major impact on Christian worship. This is where we get worship bands, multiple singers, uh, electrified instruments, leading singing, leading worship, uh, and, and we got to the place where congregational singing was called worship. Okay, we now reach our time of worship as though we haven't been doing worship before that and we don't do it after we stop singing. Very different kind of understanding. Um, it's also true that out of all of that kind of contemporary situation, broadly speaking, by the end of the 20th century, contemporary worship had developed into three main themes or styles. And you can, again, identify your church in one of these, I think. Um, in no particular order. These are not ranked by priority or by history. Uh, just, you have to, in fact, the one book I study, it talks about left, right, and center. Um, but even then, you know, left is sinister, so it's a <laughs> um, First, there are those who make the strongest attempt to connect with the culture around them, and so are more uh, distant from the, the more historic the most distant from the more historic worship habits. This is the new paradigm churches. These are the secret churches. And they tend to be much more music oriented. Okay, you can see that. They tend to be worship music, worship band. Uh, that's their focus. And so they are more different than what history has b before. And they are more oriented toward connecting with the culture. That's why you have contemporary music. That's why you have seeker services. The second are those who stand out on the opposite end of the scale as most distinct from um, any influence, it should be any influence, sorry, not any influence, any influence from contemporary culture. And so they are closest to the more historic worship patterns. This, um, you know, the, the first group, by the way, would include Willow Creek, um, Saddleback, Hillsong Music and Hillsong Church, Vineyard Fellowship. This one, 
would include the higher liturgy churches. Catholic Church, Anglican Church, the Orthodox Church, they are the ones that are more table-oriented, you might say, or more Eucharist-oriented, where the center point of all of their worship services is the offering of communion, of the Eucharist. So, those are the two ends of the spectrum. The newer, embrace culture and use it to your best advantage, more music-oriented, those that are more historically oriented, more liturgical, more formal in the liturgy, and therefore more Eucharist oriented. And then the third, those in the center, are those who have both an interest in preserving ancient patterns of worship, but also seek to be obedient in helping transform culture. These are more word oriented. Word being preaching, reading of scripture, focus on the Bible uh, as primary. That means that they tend to be, because they're in the middle, they tend to be more blended in the worship style. Those are Reformed churches, like Presbyterians, Methodist churches, and some Baptist churches. They are willing to draw from both the hist historic, but also the more contemporary culture. And from what I've been describing today, I hope you can see that we as a church, while we're very traditional in some of the things we do, we are looking to try to engage with our culture as actively as we can, whether it be in the, in the actual worship service or in the things surrounding that. Now, the realities of modern worship and the contemporary situation of worship are way more complicated than this, but this gives us kind of some big handles that we can see where we're coming from and recognize that there are, historically speaking, there are great truths to be found that we don't have to reinvent the wheel, nor is our particular style, our spiritual style, our worship style, the only one that's out there. The whole point is that we as churches can be, we got a lot to choose from. And our whole focus should be what will help us, as John Wilber said, in our pursuit of intimacy with God. What will help us in leading the people toward a more satisfying, but also a, a style of worship that is more glorifying to God. And we don't have to just stay where we are. We need to understand that there are options we can choose from. And a lot of this has to do with worship reform. It has to do with people making decisions about how are we going to do our worship, or how are we going to change it, how are we going to reform it. A theologian named James White, who specializes in worship, says this, The purpose of worship reform is not the elimination of multiplicity or the achievement of administrative efficiency. Worship reform is simply to enable people to worship with deeper commitment and participation, which may require more denominations and traditions rather than fewer. So what I'm suggesting is not we need to, you know, we all need to go back to one form. We simply have to be aware of what is our form and what options, what alternatives have historically existed that we can draw from in order to make it a more enriching experience for everybody and more glorifying to God. Questions about any of that? Hopefully that helps. Do you all see where you are in this whole kind of historical theme? You have a sense of it? Again, there's, it's, not, it's more complicated than just you know, one, two, three, or these five histories, but I think we can see at least elements of all of that. And to recognize there may be pieces of this that we, we can and should be accessing in our personal lives, in, our, in the worship of our churches, that we can draw on. Okay? No questions? Thank you all.